I was just kind of pursuing that route. And it came naturally what was going on in philosophy and theology, because these people were passionate about formalizing normative truth claims for the most part. And then when I came into graduate school, I was completely derailed because I went into philosophy of religion, uh, which, which sounds like a natural progression, but philosophy of religion in a religious studies environment is a completely different thing, right? It's not philosophical theology per se, as you'll experience it, for example, in philosophy departments or in theological schools, you know, where you're trying to formalize, you know, arguments for the existence of God and things like that. I had all that background, but when I came to study uh, philosophy of religion in religious studies, I encountered a completely different world. Um, so that all of the things that I was trained to do, basically, even my dissertation topic, didn't fit <laughs> with a career or vocation in religious studies. So I basically had to reconfigure everything that I had learned so that I could create a job for myself in academia, which is, which is precisely what happened. So I threw myself into making the life of my students easier because I didn't want to commit them to the things I was formally trained to do. They weren't there for you know, problems of evil and Christian preoccupations and things like that. So I had to kind of figure out a way that I could negotiate my formative background um, because I wanted to be competent in what I was doing um, with the challenges and needs of the context within which I taught. So when I started teaching, there was this disjointedness that I was experiencing in terms of how am I going to create necessary bridges from the kind of preoccupation that I feel is existentially paramount in a religious studies environment without imposing a restrictive philosophical pursuit. I'm at pains to describe a very generalized sense of philosophy that makes some headway in religious studies environment, right? Because religion scholars had long ago distanced themselves from the kind of philosophical pursuits that philosophers of religion generally encounter. That is the pressing concern I had. How do you bring together the normative types of inquiry that make up the field historically, and also like in a disciplined fashion where you have philosophy and theology that are still continuing doing different things, uh, but outside of religious studies context where there is an antipathy to a philosophy of religion. So religious studies then, teaching in that environment, getting students through with their projects under the umbrella term of philosophy of religion had to have a different sense to it. And of course, as somebody who was influenced very much by the continental tradition, I was lucky because it was the continental tradition that birthed religious studies, right? Uh, with Hegel and Kant, uh, German idealism and German romanticism in particular, which I had uh, quite a bit of training in. So I had to bring in both the existential normative concerns, and I had to formalize it in such a way that the concerns of the continental tradition served as problematic for my aims. Why? The backdrop against which I labor is the death of the subject, the elimination of subjectivity as it grew from Descartes through uh, to Hegel and others, right? And so in the post-structuralist context, this has been completely problematized and I had to formalize it in a way to myself so that I could both contribute to what I'm a specialist in which is philosophy of religion, but also in terms of my uh, pedagogy, okay? how I, where I teach, whom I teach, and stuff like that. So basically my personal orientation, my professional concerns threw me into this research project. It wasn't something that I inherited from, you know, my supervisor or something like that saying, you know, there's this area in Heidegger studies that needs to be developed more and I'd like you to do that. Very much made it my own. 
I had um, a sensitivity to the alienation that students felt as religion students to the type of work that I do. And so to make my life fulfilling, I had to come up with a methodological approach of teaching something that I find valuable, not only valuable in terms of academic dividends, but personal value, something that a student who studies religion can take away from what I basically teach them and also to apply it personally in their life to know how they can do this. So that's how I came up with this notion of an ecstasis. An ecstasis was um, something that just uh, came out of me more or less out of frustration. I, I had about eight or nine years of teaching to feel that frustration where the problematic of what I was trying to achieve was constantly emphasized. What you're doing is just a throwback to a prior generation. It no longer works. We've experienced the linguistic turn now. We don't have a need for subjectivity or you're just a foundationalist. You're a Cartesian. You're all of this and all of that. And this went hand in hand with my specialty topic, which was Lonergan studies. I was involved in the thought of the Catholic Canadian philosopher theologian Bernard Lonergan. My project to get where I am had to go through uh, what he went through. Namely, he was being accused of being a foundationalist, blah, 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 blah. And to a certain extent, I agree, but it's it's a highly nuanced way in which I agree. But in a certain way, I've also tried to tease out elements from his philosophy that I find completely insightful, and that I was very worried about when I started teaching that I was neglecting. One of the wonderful things about Lonergan is that academia is never something that is just done by rote or something that we learn information. It was always a question of getting to the normative structures of inquiry to get some sort of sense of self-discovery. And as I was teaching students, you know, the philosophies of Nietzsche and people like that, I didn't have a way to negotiate a path that students could find the relevance in this stuff for their life. So I felt this utter responsibility to formalize what I found useful, but somehow out of joint with the zeitgeist. I recognized very much that the stuff that I was schooled on was problematic in a context that had experienced Foucault, Derrida, um, Heidegger, and all all the rest of them. So that's why uh, when I came up with the term anextasis, it was exasperation to just say, I still know how I feel about certain things. I recognize that the language is problematic. And so here's a new term to draw things anew for myself. That term anextasis was just my way of saying, I've read enough, now is the time to formalize things for myself. So that's what this project generally is. It's my formulation of a project that has worked, I think. I still have a job, so I'm assuming it works. When I started formalizing anextasis, it was my way of saying Heidegger was a really important individual in the 20th century for problematizing the whole paradigm that Nietzsche was already flagging. But I wasn't going to become a Heideggerian where I had to do fundamental ontology. And that would have to be my my philosophy, strictly speaking, you know? So then you go down that track where you are a Heideggerian or you're a commentator of Heidegger, but you're not given space to formalize your own voice, what you experience in yourself. That's why the first line in the uh, introduction that I gave you is basically the singularity that I'm talking about when I talk about an ecstasis. A voice within whispers strangeness, right? That sense that anytime you're encountering an idea, it resonates, but at the same time, you know, there's an irreducible something about yourself that can't fully embrace that. So in ecstasis, that particular chapter, A Disposition for Our Times, was my kind of exasperated cry to both my colleagues in religious studies and philosophy of religion, theology, to say that I think I have something to contribute to the stalemate that we've reached in religious studies when it comes to negotiating the normative concerns 
that social scientific types in religious studies don't have time for, or they recognize it as pure metaphysics, pure philosophy, and not really something that constitutes religious studies as such, which is, of course, some of the reasons why I've been using people like Foster Strong and Onishi and uh, Tyler Roberts and people like that who are trying to do the same thing, but you know, organizing it along the route of their own problematic, their own research projects. So anexthasis for me was just a way of saying this destructive element in Heidegger, destruction of uh, the subject, still has a care for self, right? Or it still um, formalizes the need for real life to understand the significance of what is ready at hand. Heidegger formalizes it in terms of fundamental ontology. And I thought that that was a really important foothold into the contemporary discussion, which is post-Heideggerian, but nonetheless is indebted to Heidegger. They're listening to Heidegger more than they are to Lonergan and and Kant and uh, the German idealist school. So anekstasis was taking the term ekstatikon in Greek, static, which Heidegger gave an ontological significance to in terms of engaged inquiry. Je meinigkeit, a mindness that accompanies all of our questioning and being in the world. So I said, that's what I'm talking about, but I don't want to put it in strictly Heideggerian terms. So I add the preposition n from the Greek to ekstatikon, so an ecstatic. The dynamic is present in Heidegger, but by adding N to it, by formalizing it, by taking this in and out sense, out waiting for being, in standing, in care, putting it in ontic terms. Ontic terms meaning relating that kind of concern to the thing that Heidegger wanted to avoid, namely ontic sciences, anything related to entities. For Heidegger, he wants to place the burden on the call of being and not the sciences, because it's the sciences in focusing on zyenda, beings, entities, that have led us away from hearing being. I like that. I like the standing out for being, namely giving the predominancy of agency to being over against subjectum, over Descartes' subject. And I liked that context of standing in, um, standing in care, right? In the throneness of being toward death. I liked that, I liked that dynamic. But by creating the neologism and ecstasis, I'm saying that the kind of analysis that I do is not Heideggerian fundamental ontology, but it's artistic form of reflection that's paramount for anybody interested in ontic sciences, anybody who's interested in entities or uh, things of that nature, the determinative types of formulations. That's a hard dance to do. Yeah, that's why I call it a jig, right? It's a graceful kind of balancing of different concerns. It irritates people because it seems like I'm just dodging things all the time. But that's not the case at all. I'm just saying the programmatic of an ecstatic philosophy of religion cannot be seen as philosophy of religion in the traditional sense, nor can it be seen as philosophy of religion in the continental sense, Derridian, Foucauldian, and whatnot, or Heideggerian. It's a different maneuver, which can tie to the question of incongruity and difference that we've learned from Roberts, right? Singularity. It ties to singularity as it moves through the specificities of the ontic sciences that inform religious studies. That, for me, was my way of kind of stepping into the ring and knowing what I'm doing in concert with what has been done, but also in finding a place and creating a space for people to do it themselves according to their own specializations in religious studies. Because religious studies students have this kind of conundrum of being faced with highly specialized philosophies, 
that they're either going to reiterate and hence not really discover in themselves how they really feel about these things or be given the, the room to reflect upon that. So they're just following stuff, becoming highly specialized themselves, doing the important work of scholarship, but all the while kind of feeling somehow this disconnect that they've never really negotiated, how they actually feel or what they're thinking. In a nutshell, that's where anexthesis comes from. That's the general history of it and the etymological significance of it tied to Heidegger, but not limited to Heidegger or Derrida or the people that are in that train who are so-called anti-subjective or like anti-Cartesian, anti foundationalist I've taken it away from that kind of aporia and put it in the tension of the individual, the singularity that has to negotiate its way through the various discourses. Teaching was such a wake up call for me because I was very happy being in my study and knowing all the you know, nitty gritty about what was going on in the scholarly questions that I had about this and that topic. But when I had to face students who were looking at me, either puzzled, completely disoriented by what I was teaching them, hating it, in fact, it became one of my pressing concerns to make it meaningful, to give them that sense that meaning is still important. It's a way of locating the movement of self-discovery so that it's different from the self. One feels incongruous with that self because that self is the only self you know, but you don't. And it's constantly evolving. It's an elusive thing that destabilizes your determinate conceptions of it. Education does that. What does education do? It disrupts you. Well, good education should, for the sake of being dynamic and never static. So it's a way of recognizing the close correlation between the singularity, which is elusive, and the determinations of that singularity. That's why I tie uh, anexthesis with the artistic, right? Because the artistic is always a kind of experiential form of thinking that constantly disrupts the systematic. The dividends of that is that the determinations, any determination, any ism, anything, will always be kept in play. It's always a question of making sure that there's a, a, a conversation taking place between all of these discourses that give a better sense of self and also a better sense of applicability how you can apply the discourses with regard to your own academic wants and needs, your intellectual wants and needs. That's why that last chapter there is the last chapter for me, because it is, uh, I think, fundamental to configuring what I consider to be an ecstatic philosophy of religious studies. We do dialectical work, that is, we're mediating knowledge of the past, history, interpretations of stuff constantly, and that were related in a kind of object constitutive fashion to some thing, to some object, to some formalization. But there's also the question of foundations, and I'm just using the terms from Lonergan. He describes these as functional specialties, but I use them as ciphers for the most part in terms of how I deal with the concrete scholarly stuff, the stuff that I'm constantly faced with in analyzing any object of study, but also the decisions I have to make with respect to my normative structures, right? So foundations where you make a decision based on what you dialectically mediate. Right? And so that's the opening of the self. That's the opening of mediated meaning. That is my sense of what is authentic, what I'm dialectically mediating. And it helps give it a form. It helps me see an orientation that is useful for the philosopher of religious studies who constantly has to 
you know, be dealing with determinate forms of scholarship and history and ideas, but at the same time, not just mediating that and worrying about whether it's being mediated erroneously or correctly. It's a question of also deciding for oneself how I am going to either forward those normative claims of the objects that I'm interested in or reverse them. How am I going to be personally engaged in the work of scholarship? For me, an ecstasis is uh, the allowance of thinking the singularity, confrontation with elemental meaning, and making some sort of decision about it. Like in the conversation about Beckett, people that are locked onto those discourses as exclusivistic Beckettian assumptions or Cartesian assumptions sometimes don't manage the elemental meaning question. Like, what is the intonation of Beckett's discourse? Why is Descartes doing what he's doing? What is he valuing in talking about the cogitor? What he's valuing is basically knowledge, right? The, he's valuing like, we need to be self-critical. We need to somehow get to a proper basis that can give us pure and true knowledge, right? And Beckett is saying that basis doesn't exist. And what's Beckett valuing? He's valuing the fact that it's impossible to formalize that. And he's tripping up any discourse through the novel, through you know, his narrative voice, which then, of course, is ready for an appropriation. It's ready to become a philosophy. Same with Descartes. Descartes' elemental meaning can be at odds with Cartesianism. Beckett's elemental meaning can be at odds with Beckettianism. This is where Derrida is masterful too. He does the same thing with Plato. Plato is too platonic. Do you know what I mean? He falls into his own doctrine. I think Derrida manages elemental meaning in very, very cool ways. And he shows the problematic of making the move to the philosophy. And it's sometimes that move to the philosophy which creates barriers to true openness of the discourse itself. So for me, an ecstasis was my way of saying that you can put Descartes and Beckett together at this level. You can't do it at the level of Cartesianism or Beckettianism because it's either or there. But if you, as that singularity, that individual negotiating different elemental meanings, you know, you're open to the, let's call it the pattern, the orientation, what the value is being expressed in that, you can make up your mind about, you know, who you're closer to or where you're going to walk with regard to this specific question or that specific question, this concern, this problematic. And that's why I talked about Zizek's appropriation of Beckett, you know, um, where he does his kind of Hegelian, Lacanian reception of Beckett's elemental meaning. That's fine. <laughs> I advocate that. But I'm saying it becomes problematic when the elemental meaning dismissed of any other appropriation, right? I reserve the right to read Beckett without necessarily following the translation or interpretation of Zizek, however insightful I find it. And it's not to just say that's where Zizek is wrong and this is where that person is wrong. It's where I'm saying that appropriation doesn't fully resonate with who I am. It's giving room to make that decision. But yeah, that's it. Um, It was that chapter that really helped me formalize my relationship to um, Robert's, I find, magnanimous treatment of religion in the context of religious studies. Um, when I discussed the term anexthasis in chapter three, it was my exasperated cry for just saying, I have a voice, I have beliefs, I have things. Um, 
that courage came as I was steeped in the literature. I saw that. It wasn't subjectivity that was problematic, but it was a certain reception of Descartes' notion of the subject that was problematic and seen as a symptom of a far deeper problem in the Western philosophical tradition. But none of them liked talking about subjectivity because of that association. I see an opening here to reformalize my own primary difficult concerns with subjectivity, myself, my personal appropriation. I focused on Roberts in particular because he was doing it explicitly with regard to actual religious discourses. And so that's why I call it object constituent, because he's thinking and ecstatically about a way of mediating object constitutive normative engagement. How are you with respect to this value system in religious discourse A, B, C, D? What that helped me do was to formalize to myself what I was doing and what I was interested in. And it wasn't necessarily that, although I'm on board at, in a religious studies context, but was more or less interested in the subject constitutive nature of the mediation of that kind of knowledge. How do you make it an explicit preoccupation for students to know what they're doing when they're doing that? Because what it, what it means, why I say it's subject constitutive, it means that you are the focus. What is it about it that resonates with me? Do I need some sort of change in myself? Roberts isn't doing that. He's calling you to that kind of procedure, but he's focused on all the various individuals, Santner, Caputo, their ideas, Rowan Williams, and so on, right? The specific religious discourses. And he's offering up ideas for how to mediate that knowledge in this environment. I'm not interested in that per se. I see it as a compliment to what I do. I see it as a compliment because I feel it's an ecstatic. I feel it's very much a question about foundational discourse, but it's oriented toward some specific object. I'm interested in making explicit a little bit more the notion of subjectivity in an artistic, practical mediation. What's happening with me as I'm doing this? Why am I feeling this way? Um, when I'm studying the history of this, when I'm reading Durkheim, when I'm reading Weber, when I'm reading Heidegger, when I'm reading all, what's happening to me and why am I feeling the way I do? Is it like politically motivated? Is it, is it gender related? Is it about how uh, disruptive I feel when I'm reading this? It's that kind of self-reflective endeavor, which opens up new possibilities for the formalization. So I have nothing against object constitutive discourses, but I found that the contribution that I could make from uh, Lonergan through Derrida to Winquist and some of the other individuals I said is to make it a self-reflexive venture, you know, to, to be explicit about one's own foundations. And I like Tyler Roberts because he doesn't really propose a philosophy as such. He proposes a descriptive orientation for how we can negotiate religious discourse in our contemporary context to engage with what he calls the discourse of resistance. And so I, I find that in a religious studies context, far more religious studies than philosophy of religion. I, I like Roberts because I see him doing something practical for the religious studies student with regard to a philosophical, uh, he formalizes it in a way that, I don't know, it's more evocative than anything else. He's not really proposing a philosophy per se. He's trying to evoke in students of religion a new appreciation for the discourses of resistance in a contemporary religious studies post-secular environment. I find it a kindred philosophical appreciation, but that's his contribution. It's not mine. Uh, and that's why I, I, I wrote this book finally, because I said, okay, listen, I've been talking about all of these things and fragments across 10 years, and I just want to put it out there and get some sort of reaction and then formalize it in some other way later on when there's more coherence to it. But I think it's important enough to release 
so that we can get on with the work now of philosophy of religion qua religious studies. And so it's, it's been an answer both to the humanistic side and also to the social scientific side. And I try to so-called ground it in an ecstasis, which is to say to ground it in you, to ground it in me as individuals who are trained to make the applications. Others can't make it for us. That's, uh, that's key. That's key. For me. <laughs>